I am uh, thrilled to uh, be here with you all this morning. Thank you for, or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, I am thrilled to welcome uh, Nicole Perlroth uh, uh, today. Uh, Nicole covers cybersecurity and digital espionage uh, for the New York Times. Uh, she's covered Russian hacks and nuclear power plants, airports, elections, uh, North Korea cyber attacks against movie studios, banks and hospitals, uh, Iranian attacks on oil companies, banks, the Trump campaign, hundreds of Chinese cyber attacks, uh, including a month long uh, hack of the Times and most recently uh, the Colonial Pipeline uh, hack. Uh, her first book, uh, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends, is out. Uh, I had the, I've had a chance to read it through and it's, it's a wonderful and riveting uh, look into the, 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 the black and gray markets for zero day vulnerabilities. Um, uh, the book and several of Nicole's uh, Times articles have been optioned for television, uh, so stay tuned. Uh, a Bay Area native, uh, Ms. Pearl Roth is a guest lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, a graduate of Princeton University and a graduate of Stanford's journalism uh, program. Um, I'm Andy Grotto. I direct the program on geopolitics, technology, and governance here at Stanford, and I'm going to turn it over to Nicole uh, to get us started. Over to you, Nicole. Thank you so much, Andy, and thank you, Stanford. I'm only 10 minutes away, and hopefully we can do this in person uh, sometime soon. And as Andy mentioned, I did go to Stanford. I actually grew up in the shadow of Stanford, not far away in Portola Valley. So I was thinking today, uh, I would actually personalize this talk a little bit. I've been doing a lot of book talks over the past few months, but it's pretty neat to be able to do this um, at an institution so close to my heart. So uh, yes, I wrote a book. It's called, This is How They Tell Me the, the World Ends. Uh, it, it really, the, the reason I wrote this book was actually, it was just one of those stories that unfortunately left me no choice but to cover. I'd had uh, several personal upfront episodes with the black and gray market for cyber weapons and cyber vulnerabilities that I'll share right now. And you can see that you know, together, I really had no choice but to dig into this market. So um, one of the first things that happened is I got a job at the New York Times covering cybersecurity. I actually had warned the New York Times that not only had I never covered cybersecurity when they asked to interview me, I had gone out of my way to learn as little about cybersecurity as possible. But I agreed to go do the interviews, and I was very candid with some of the editors I met with during the interview process. And I said, here is actually a list of cybersecurity journalists who seem to be fantastic. You should consider interviewing and hiring them. And what they said back was, you don't understand. We have actually interviewed many of the people on your list, and we had no idea what they were talking about. You're hired. <laughs> so, so began my illustrious entry to the hallowed halls of the Gray Lady. Um, and one of the first things that happened was uh, the New York Times was hacked by China. Uh, we were hacked by a Chinese nation state actor. We never actually found out which group exactly it was that broke into our systems. Um, but I was able to spend several months embedded with Mandiant, which is now FireEye, uh, the security company in Silicon Valley that just uh, raised the big flag on the solar winds hack with our security team, a little time with the FBI, watching the guy or girl we called the Beijing summer intern roll into the New York Times networks at 8.30 or 9 Beijing time every morning and roll out around five. And I think the New York Times had hired me to its business desk to cover things like the business of cybersecurity, you know, Symantec's earnings, Symantec's profits, McAfee in those days. And that was, that was a story, that was a mess too at the time. But this was clearly a huge problem. There was something bigger happening. We had heard this phrase over and over again from Keith Alexander, then the director of the NSA, from Dmitry Alperovitch, one of the co-founders of CrowdStrike, uh, James Comey, had also said some variation of there are only two types of companies left in the United States, companies that have been hacked and companies that don't know they have been hacked yet. And when the New York Times was hacked, I was given this unbelievable front row seat into what that looked like to this brave new world we were living in where companies and journalists 
in our case, were now being expected to defend themselves from advanced nation state cyber threats. And for several years, I ended up covering Chinese cyber espionage. Um, I worked closely with Mandiant. Uh, we outed a number of APTs. It helped open the discussion, crack open the discussion about the Chinese cyber espionage threat. Um, it no doubt influenced some of the Obama's policies around naming and shaming China for its industrial espionage attacks and even going as far as indicting several members of the PLA and the unit uh, we outed as uh, Unit 61398, which was based in Shanghai. So that was one element. Um, you know, I could see that American companies were now up against these nation state threats. Um, the other thing was Snowden came along. And one of the backstories of Snowden that most people aren't really familiar with is that the GCHQ, the NSA's counterpart in the UK, uh, went to the Guardian's headquarters and said, give us back these hard drives that Snowden had stolen from the NSA. And, you know, actually I learned a lot about press freedoms, but the UK doesn't have the same level of press freedom that we enjoy here in the United States. And so, the Guardian was left with no choice but to take whirring blades to their hard drives of classified NSA GCHQ secrets. But the one thing they didn't tell the GCHQ is that they'd actually smuggled a copy of those hard drives to the New York Times. And at that very moment, I was actually locked in Arthur Sulzberger's storage closet with several Guardian reporters and Scott Shane, who's a veteran national security reporter, Re Rebecca Corbett, who you might know from editing some of the Harvey Weinstein Me Too series at the New York Times. We were locked in a closet actually because one of the requirements for being given access to these hard drives was that we work out of a windowless room. And if you've ever passed by the New York Times office building in New York, you can see that it is actually, there are, there, there are windows everywhere. The whole building was designed by Renzo Piano as a model for full transparency. There are no windowless rooms in the building with the exception of Arthur's storage closet and the bathrooms. So we were locked in the storage closet. And one of the things I kept seeing littered throughout these documents were vague references to holes in widely used technology, like windows, um, like Facebook, like routers, like switches, like uh, firewalls, like antivirus software. It was very clear from looking at these documents that the NSA had some access, some backdoor access to every widely available commercial technology on the market and backdoor access to some technologies that we do not even know of here in the United States, niche technologies used by uh, businesses and diplomats in places like Pakistan or Afghanistan uh, or yeah, at the Russian embassy in Kiev, that kind of thing. So I wanted to know where these had come from. It was clear that many of these access points had been developed internally at the NSA, but they also made vague references to a market that they were tapping into for these goods. And here's where I'll stop and say that there is one technical aspect to this talk that I need to back up and share with you. And I promise it won't get more technical than this, but I need to tell you what a zero day is. So a zero day is a flaw in software or hardware that the software maker or hardware maker is not familiar with or does not know exists yet. And if I'm a hacker at the most basic level, if I find a zero day flaw in your iOS iPhone software, for instance, and I develop the code to exploit that flaw, write the program to exploit it, I could potentially use it to read your text messages or track your location or your contacts or turn on your video or audio feed without you knowing about it. That would be called an iOS zero day exploit. And as you probably can see, that would have immense value for spy agencies because essentially what our iPhones have become are digital ankle bracelets. They know everything about us. So the going rate for that kind of iPhone iOS zero day exploit right now is $2.5 million. There are brokers around the Beltway that actively advertise on their websites that they'll pay you $2.5 million if you turn over that zero day exploit to them with the caveat that you can never tell Apple about it because the minute Apple finds out about it, they will fix it, they will patch it, they will roll it into a software update. You'll get that annoying prompt on your phone to, to uh, do your run your software updates. And that $2.5 million investment turns to mud the minute everyone updates their software. 
And these brokers are essentially buying these from hackers and selling them to government agencies. But no one wanted to talk about this market. I joke in the book that the first rule of the zero day market is nobody talks about the zero day market. And the second rule of the zero day market is nobody talks about the zero day market. Um, but it was very clear looking through those Snowden documents that the NSA and GCHQ were tapping to some extent into the zero day market. Now, like I said, very little was known about this market. There had been a great article by my former colleague, Andy Greenberg, uh, when we were together at Forbes, where he profiled a guy who was on Twitter named The Gruck. Um, the Gruck is a South African who lives in Thailand and is a zero day broker. He advertised that he would buy zero day exploits from hackers and sell them to government agencies. And Andy wrote an amazing article about The Gruck and he also sort of cracked at some of the pricing that these brokers were willing to pay for these zero day exploits. Now, the Grek would later say that he was speaking off the record, but he was also happy to pose next to a giant duffel bag of cash uh, for the story. And what I knew about that story was that, first of all, it was the first time anyone had really broken open this market in a, in a readable way. Um, but also I had heard from some of the Grek's associates that after that article had published, his business had plummeted by half and that he had become persona non grata within the government zero day market or the cyber arms market industry because no government wanted to do business with any zero day broker who would speak on the record to or pose for a photo next to a giant duffel bag of cash uh, with Forbes magazine. So that had been a great piece of journalism, but there had been a huge gap between that and when I was sitting in this room full of classified NSA secrets. And the other thing that was happening is I had gone to a dinner uh, at a conference in Miami called the S4 conference. This conference is very niche. It's very specific to industrial security. Um, but that the first night at the conference, I had been asked to dinner with two guys from Malta, there were two Italians from Malta who had recently started a new startup, which trafficked in zero day exploits, but of a particular flavor. They sold zero day exploits and developed zero day exploits in industrial control systems like Schneider Electric, like Siemens software. This is the software that makes its way into our power plants, our nuclear plants, uh, our hospitals, our railways, our transportation systems, our chemical refineries. And I could not believe this business model. You sell zero day exploits in, in software that makes its way into our transportation systems to governments. And I asked them at the center, who do you sell to? And more importantly, who will you not sell to? Will you not sell this to Iran or China or Russia or North Korea? And they really refused to answer this question. And so when you sort of linked these things together, the fact that I was seeing um, nation state attacks up front, not just from China anymore, but coming from disparate uh, points in the world like North Korea, like Iran, um, and newer players like the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, we were catching uh, zero day exploits being used by those governments to spy on the phones of dissidents and journalists. When you looked at where the world was going in terms of all using the same commercial technology, not just for our communications, but increasingly embedding it into the internet of things and into our critical infrastructure, like our nuclear plants and power systems and water treatment facilities. And the fact that nobody wanted to talk about this market and the fact that they were trafficking and vulnerabilities in some of these most critical systems, all of these things started converging in my life. <laughs> And I realized I had no choice but to back up and take a closer look at this market. And that is essentially what this book is. It is a in-depth investigation of the cybersecurity, sorry, cyber arms trade, and also my personal quest to get to the bottom of this. Because like I said, this is probably the hardest topic I could have approached because it is the one topic nobody in cybersecurity and intelligence wants to discuss. Um, and what I learned was that this really started with a hack by our enemies on our own systems. This started as far back as the Cold War, when we discovered a Russian implant in the typewriters at the American embassy in Moscow. It was an amazing, heroic effort by the NSA to uncover that implant. 
And it was the first really eye-opening moment for American intelligence agencies that, wait a minute, the Russians can plant this kind of implant in our digital systems and record everything we're typing. And it doesn't matter how many, how much encryption we add later, they are capturing everything in plain text before we encrypt it. Jesus Christ, if we don't catch up in this space, if we don't start attacking every new typewriter, PC, router, iPhone, Windows uh, software update, we are going to be so screwed. We will lose the Cold War and we will lose whatever war comes our way next. And that began, so began sort of the U.S. intelligence agency's efforts to break into every new technology that hit the market. Now, 20 years ago, there wasn't a real moral hazard baked in there because the Russians were using one type of typewriter. We were using IBM Selectric, uh, Selectric typewriters. In China, they were using Huawei. For the most part, we still weren't using Huawei systems here. But these days, with the exception of Huawei, which is still very much in the news as the glaring exception, we are all using the same technology. So when US intelligence agencies or our allies or our adversaries find a zero day in Windows and they keep that secret for their own counterintelligence programs or their own battlefield preparations, they are also logically leaving their own citizens less safe. And what I could see from my perch at the New York Times is that it, cyber attacks were hitting Americans more frequently in more visceral ways than ever before. I was drowning in them. And the book was really my effort to pull my head up and ask why this was happening, why we were so vulnerable. And ultimately what it came down to, I believe, was incentives. Government has an incentive to use these holes for espionage. Businesses don't want to worry about security. There is no return on investment for security. Uh, they would rather get their product, whether it's their software or their gadget or whatever it is, to market before the competition and get as much market share as possible. And they can fix security problems and glitches later with remote software updates. Still very much the move fast and break thing mindset that Mark Zuckerberg famously espoused at Facebook. And individuals, for us, security is just really annoying. We don't want to run our software updates. We don't want to use two-factor authentication if it's going to slow us down. We, want, we don't want to remember long passwords. We don't want to bother with a password manager. Security has always been very annoying. And when you add up all of these things, you see that we are headed towards an increasingly more vulnerable place. The latest threat is obviously ransomware. I just covered the attack on Colonial Pipeline. It brings up a lot of these issues. Here is a company that runs a major conduit, nearly half the gas, jet fuel, and diesel for the East Coast, that has no minimum cybersecurity standards. There are no regulations saying you need to use two-factor authentication. You need to use up-to-date secure software. You need to use strong patch management and passwords. There's no regulation there. And when it was hit with ransomware, it went ahead and shut off the pipeline because it couldn't capture billing information on gas outflows. And when I spoke to people at the White House, they said that the company was essentially telling them to go pound sand. They didn't want to deal with the federal government. They wanted to pay the ransom, which they did, and make this thing go away. And it taps into a lot of the themes I get into the, in the book. So I'll probably stop there and let Andy pepper me with questions and I can talk about journalism or um, industrial cyber attacks or ransomware or the market, whatever you have, you can throw at me. Uh, all questions, welcome. Great. Well, thanks, Nicole. That was that was a terrific uh, overview, and um, you know, and it, 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 your your story of how you came to cyber, I think, is is you know, for for our generation, a pretty common one um, because the, the discipline, uh, you know, clearly there there have been people concerned about information security, you know, for for as long as there have been computers, but you know. It's only gone mainstream in the past couple of decades, and it's not like there were, you know, established, you know, career tracks, established courses of study uh, available. Uh, and you know, I, so many of us kind of came to cyber, uh, you know, uh, serendipitously, depending on your perspective. Um, so I, I wanted to, to start with with you know, by asking you, I mean, in your view, based on on what you found in in, in your investigation, 
should the U.S. government ever hold on to zero day vulnerabilities? Yeah, it's a great question. So this is not a black and white issue. You know, I, I, I don't, by the end of the book where I come out is, no, we shouldn't turn over every zero day that we find. We should hold ourselves, however, to the criteria we say that we take into account when we hold on to a zero day, such as how widely used is this software? If it's Windows, that should bias us in favor of getting it fixed right away because whether you know it or not, you use Windows in your daily life. You might not have a Windows PC, but our power grid in a lot of places runs on Windows and our pipelines and our water treatment plants. Um, also, you know, how difficult is this to exploit? You know, it used to be that we had an acronym for this at the NSA, they called it NOBUS, stood for nobody but us. If we think nobody but us could exploit this, then we'll hold on to it. Well, the problem with NOBUS is that there are a lot of nation states who see a huge asymmetric advantage in cyber, who know they can never match our spending or our capabilities militarily, but they can kill us in death by a thousand cuts and they are investing in cyber to do so. And they are investing in the capabilities and they are buying these capabilities in the market in some cases. And so I think Novus is falling apart. And I do think we need to really recalibrate what we consider Novus. Um, and so if there is a vulnerability that requires you know, quantum computing to exploit, then sure, maybe we can hold on to that for a while. But there are a lot of nation states out there investing in these capabilities. And I think arrogance is, is the wrong strategy here. So yes, I think we, we can hold on to some of these. I think we know very little about the zero day exploits that the government has held on to unless they've been hacked as is what happened with, with the NSA's zero day exploit stockpile a couple of years ago when someone, we still don't know who, but they called themselves the shadow brokers appeared online and started dribbling out some of the NSA zero day exploits and hacking tools over the next several months. And one of the zero day exploits they released was a zero day exploit they called Eternal Blue, which was an exploit for Microsoft Windows software. And it turns out they'd held on to this for more than five years. And this was a hole in Windows software. This was a problem with Windows software, which like I said, is some of the most widely used commercial technology on the market today. And I think that is unacceptable. I think that should have been turned in a long time ago. But when I interviewed people at the NSA, they said, Nicole, you don't understand. Eternal Blue was getting us some of the best counterintelligence we have ever gotten. It was never seriously up for consideration. We would turn it over to Microsoft. And that is the thing I think needs to change. If it's getting us some of the best counterintelligence, okay, but fix it in a timeline that makes sense. Don't hold on to it for five years. And I think part of my goal with the book was to sort of out this market so that we can do more research into the timeline between when a zero day exploit is discovered and when it gets killed or when there's a zero day collision attack, which means someone else finds it and uses it somewhere else. We need a lot more research and transparency there so we can make more informed decisions beyond just re relying on this no bus, very vague, arrogant strategy of no bus and American exceptionalism. It's not going to work. Yeah, the tr transparency is tough here because, you know, by, by, by definition, right, being more transparent about the intelligence gains from use of a zero day uh, risks burning that, that capability. Um, you know, and there's, there's, you know, this, this famous example uh, it's a macabre example of uh, the UK uh, during World War II having a double agent in Germany um, and, um, you know, learning that, um, you know, because it had gained access to the Gestapo's uh, communications that the Gestapo was prepared to kidnap and, and murder this guy and the, the British government chose to not, you know, not, not, not tell this poor person uh, because they were concerned about blowing their, 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 their source. And that's kind of an extreme example, but I'm wondering, you know, because there's a there's a ledger here, right? There's sort of mm -hmm. a, you know, there's there's a, a an obvious risk to society in, you know, especially a vulnerability that, um, you know, that 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 scales right across, you know, uh, you know, many different targets, like 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 a like a Windows vulnerability or an iOS vulnerability. Um, on the other hand, like for, for that same reason, right? Like it, it's it's also you know 
risky, right? Because more people are exposed. And I, so to me, I think, you know, I, I keep coming back to uh, this, 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 this question of, I look at, you know, this, you know, part of what I think you, you've done really well in your book is sort of tra- tra- track the history. And you can sort of pull a little bit of pricing history from the book. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, zero days were cheap, right? Um, because, you know, to pick on Microsoft a little bit, security was not high on the mind of, of Windows uh, software developers, to, to put it mildly. Um, and so, you know, just because the supply of zero days was so high, the zero days were relatively inexpensive. I mean, quite inexpensive in some cases, like almost worthless. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we've, we've seen, you know, uh, call it inflation, call it, you know, what you will, but the prices have gone up. It's even so, like, you know, you mentioned, um, you know, two and a half million dollars is the going rate um, for an iOS uh, vulnerability. That seems cheap to me still, right? You know, yes. and, 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 Very. It, 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 <laughs> and, and I think it highlights your point about how the incentives and the underlying economics of the, the digital technology marketplace are just uh, messed up. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's, it's a box, you know, markets don't do well in a box. Um, and this market in particular is incredibly inefficient. Um, they're really, there's no rhyme or reason to some of the pricing. Um, you know, we have seen, you know, like you said, inflation, well, maybe that's a good thing. It means that actually some of these companies are investing yeah. more in security. So it makes their software harder to exploit. Dan gear, who, uh, works at Incutel, the CIA's venture capital far- firm, famously gave a talk a few years ago where he said that he thinks the strategy is that the United States should start offering uh, double, you know, the price of these mm. zero-day exploits and buy that, buy them all up, use them, and then make sure they get fixed. And that that way we're sort of taking them away from potential adversaries and also seeing to it that they get fixed and that they can't be used against us. And that sounds wonderful, you know, using the power of the purse to solve this problem. What I found on the ground reporting this book, particularly when I went down to Argentina, which I'm sorry, I have to backtrack a little bit here. I had heard that there was a very healthy, lively hacking culture and history of hacking in Argentina. And I wanted to go see this firsthand. And so I went down to Argentina for my book research. And lo and behold, it's true. You know, because of export restrictions, they don't have the same fun toys that we all take for granted. Amazon Prime doesn't deliver to Buenos Aires. You know, the only way for them to get an iPhone was really to smuggle it in or pay something like $3,000 plus for it at the time. Uh, And so to get access to some of the apps and services that we all take for granted here in Silicon Valley, kids in Argentina really have to hack these systems to get access to them. And that has lent itself to a very lively hacking culture. And they are known, they told me, um, as the India of exploit development. They are, they say, the world's manufacturer for zero day exploits. And the thing about Argentina too with inflation is that they can make a lot, you know, that $2 million zero day exploit paid under the table in dollars goes a long way in Buenos Aires. You can live pretty large, pretty nice apartment with a second house on a lake (laughs) for that (laughs) single zero day exploit you made that one year. Um, And when I sat down with sort of the godfather of this scene, I said, but who are they selling them to? The same question I asked those uh, hackers from Malta back in Miami a few years ago, who will they not sell them to? And I actually framed the question in a really dumb, embarrassing way. I said, will they only sell these to good Western governments? And he (laughs) laughed in my face and he said, Nicole, the last time I checked, the country that bombed another country into oblivion wasn't China or Iran. And oh, by the way, the United States helped facilitate Argentina's dirty wars. We don't think of you as a good Western government. We would actually prefer, you know, if we're working off some moral calculus, we would prefer to sell these to Iran or China or Russia than the United States. Um, and that was such an eye-opening moment because- it's terrifying. It's terrifying. And how would the U.S. even find out that this Argentine hacker has a zero-day exploit in Schneider Electric safety locks that are used in industrial control plants? Um, they wouldn't. This, this whole market is wrapped in secrecy. So if some guy 
from Saudi Arabia or Iran or who knows where comes along and offers them $3 million for that zero day, um, they'll sell it to them, no problem. And by the way, you know, I mentioned that $2.5 million price list for a zero day exploit in iOS. Well, in my book research, I found a new broker that popped up in Abu Dhabi that offers $3 million for that same capability. And there are a lot of deep pockets uh, in the Gulf. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of those zero day exploits used on dissidents, used on, um, in commercial spyware, like the kind that we found on one of the confidants of Jamal Khashoggi, um, Khashoggi and, uh, and you know, journalists and, and a, a source of mine, someone I've interviewed numerous times, Ahmed Mansour, who was just uh, advocating on Twitter for better voting rights in the UAE is still in solitary confinement after a year, after his, his phone was hacked with one of these zero day exploits. So the market is so far beyond the US, the US's control. And if you're paying attention to the news, you're seeing that there are more nation states and cyber criminals knocking on our doors, on our digital doors right now than probably any other country on earth. We are now one of the most targeted nation states on earth. So I really think we need to factor that into our calculus about whether to keep or turn over these, these holes to software and hardware manufacturers, because clearly they keep popping up in these attacks that are being used against us. Most recently, China used zero day exploits and Microsoft, Microsoft Exchange servers to go to town on the American defense industrial base. Um, you know, and on and on and on and on. Um, just in the last few months, zero days keep popping up. So um, never before has this been a more relevant topic, I think, in national security. Yeah, and I, I think you're right. And I, I you know, I, I always come back to, you know, the money. <laughs> you know, it's, it's about the Benjamins. And, um, you know, you, this is another, I think, point that really comes through in, in your book that, you know, that this community of hackers, uh, especially the ones who, are, are seeking to monetize, you know, their, um, their, their, their work, um, you know, they're, they're, they're not, they may talk a big game about ethics and morality, but at the end of the day, um, it's all about the Benjamins and, you know, humans have an incredible ability to rationalize their self-interest. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the, the idea of the U S government just paying a, a premium, right, uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, and, um, right, because the US government is not the only government in the business of purchasing zero days, as you point out. Um, and, you know, so e even if the US government, you know, were to decide, which I think would be a, a really bad idea, uh, to just, you know, end all purchases of zero day vulnerabilities, uh, it's not like that market's gonna, gonna go away. Uh, right. If anything, the price may drop, right? Because you've taken one of the big uh, buyers out of the marketplace. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, so, um, so yeah, it, 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 it's all about incentives. And I think another another angle of this that I'd love to, you know, for you to talk a little bit about is, you know, so, so zero days are are sort of the like the Ferraris or the you know the Lamborghinis of cyber vulnerabilities, but there mm -hmm. are far more. Toyotas and Volvos and Fords on the cyber street than there are, you know, in the form of just, you know, vulnerabilities that aren't zero days that are actually known that haven't been patched. What, what can you tell us about the market for the exploits that take advantage of, of those, um, you know, of the Toyotas, you know, of, of the world? Well, um, you know, and let me just back up and say, you know, the way I think about our strategy uh, in buying or, or turning over zero day exploits. I think we've been looking at it from the lens of what is going to best benefit our national security interests. But I think when you look at what these decisions actually come down to, you know, in terms of leaving people more vulnerable, leaving our critical systems more vulnerable to attack, we, are, we have been sacrificing our cybersecurity in the name of national security. But, and I just interviewed Leon Panetta on Friday about this, you know, he, some have accused him of being alarmist on this topic, but I actually have come around to his point of view, which is the next 9-11, and I hate to say this, but um, the analogies are poor in this space, but the next 9-11 is very likely to have some cyber component to it. Um, we are getting closer and closer and closer to that in the most obscure, ridiculous ways, whether it's a ransomware group, 
you know, bumping up into our pipeline systems or some hacker, we still don't know who, getting into a water treatment facility in Florida just ahead of the Super Bowl and trying to poison the water um, or catching Iranian hackers mucking around uh, the locks of one of our dams, even if it was the wrong dam, apparently. You know, we are seeing these close calls over and over again. And I do really worry about uh, getting to the point where some terrorist organization or some nihilist or who knows who uh, gets these capabilities, develops them on their own or buys them in the market and uses them against us. And it is cheap. They can do that. And, you know, we are, we have an incredibly soft underbelly here in the United States because we've just been plugging everything in without thinking about security. Um, so just to, to round out that point. Now, the market for everything else, you're right. You know, I chose to focus on the zero day exploit because I was fascinated by this moral hazard that was baked into and really this, this trade-off we were making in our cybersecurity. Um, but you're right, most attacks these days still happen in the form of spear phishing emails, password spraying, you know, testing the word admin uh, and password and maybe even SolarWinds123 on our systems and breaking in that way. Unpatched software, the basics. We there, There's really very little market for that because you don't really need a market. It's just very easy still to hack so many critical companies by finding the weakest link. And in a lot of cases, the weakest link are humans, are us. We're just not turning on two-factor authentication. We're not using different passwords. We're not updating our software. It's Clicking even worse. We shouldn't. Right. It's even worse at some of these small municipalities where some IT guy comes in and inherits 20 years of legacy software that nobody owns. And it's hard enough to take inventory of what's hitting their network, let alone secure it. And that is the biggest problem that we face. We are not even doing the bare basics. Um, it's not even worth talking about a market. It's just so easy to hack so many of these cities and schools and hospitals right now. And so I'm actually very hopeful about this new administration, the people they have put in place to tackle these efforts. I thought the latest executive order offered a very prescriptive, detailed roadmap. Obviously it will come down to execution, but they are doing things in clever ways. You know, For a long time, the US business community led by the US Chamber of Commerce has resisted any kind of regulation on the companies that uh, operate our critical infrastructure. And the big statistic there is that 85% of America's critical infrastructure is owned, operated, maintained, and secured by the private sector. And there is nothing mandating that those companies meet a bare standard of cybersecurity. And anytime this is, this, there's been attempts to legislate this, We've seen this kick down, and instead we've seen executive orders that offer up voluntary uh, standards for cybersecurity. And so one thing that was fascinating in the latest exec executive order was you can see that the, this administration is trying to use the power of the purse to change behavior. They are saying, we will work with NIST, we'll come up with a set of cybersecurity guidelines. You can self-certify. We won't even make you jump through red tape and bureaucratic hoops, you can just self-certify that you meet those bare minimum guidelines and you will probably have to show artifacts to prove that you have met them. But if we find out you're lying to us, if we find out that you're not using two-factor authentication, you are banned from ever doing business with the federal government again. And that is a very important stick in this space because most critical infrastructure uh, operators like Colonial Pipeline butt up against federal systems. So if the federal government says you can't do business with us anymore, that might make them commercially unviable. So that is a really clever trick to skirt some of the issues we've had around regulation and really use the power of the market. So so I am hopeful that that thing, this, things can change. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I also think it, it breaks a taboo that um, that has existed ever since the the failed effort um, in, in 2013 uh, in the Senate, uh, where, where I worked at the time, to pass um, comprehensive cybersecurity legislation, which included uh, originally a, uh, a regulatory element for uh, critical infrastructure. And, you know, 
my, my, my feeling ever since then has been, and there's, there's a lot we could talk about how that went down um, and sort of the, the politics that, um, you know, that, that, that both, you know, brought it down and ultimately I think hampered um, U.S. cybersecurity policymaking for, for, to this day. But my, my experience has been that there is this sort of, you know, call it, you know, a, a quiet majority of, 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 of policymakers and legislators on both sides of the aisle who don't really buy this idea that a wholly voluntary approach um, works. Yes. Yeah. And if you want to see drama, you can do this YouTube search for this fight between John McCain, who unfortunately led the effort to kill those bills, and Joe Lieberman, you know, his best friend. <laughs> I was, over yeah, that I was, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I sat in meetings with them. Uh, and, you know, uh, it was it was amazing, although I will say, you know, what, what, what ended up killing that that legislation was a chamber of commerce. And I, right. I will I will I will never forget. Um, so we had um, so this will get a little bit into the weeds of Senate procedure, um, which, you know, is unfortunately the Senate is a very procedure driven institution. Um, we we had, uh, I think, 80 something votes um, uh, for the motion to proceed on to this this big package of legislation. Uh, typically, that that's a pretty good sign that, you know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll get past um, uh, the, you know, the, the motion to get on the bill, which is, you know, where the filibuster typically comes in, uh, that we'll, we'll, we'll hit the 60 vote threshold and there will be a four debate. Um, and, you know, maybe, maybe the, the final vote is partisan, but, um, you know, members will have a chance to, you know, offer amendments and the Senate will kind of work its will in the traditional way that, that it had in the past. And that, that was, that was a, a goal shared by, I would, I would argue a majority of senators, on, again, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, in between the vote for the motion to proceed and um, the, 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 the cloture vote, um, the Chamber of Commerce uh, decided that they would score the cloture vote in their how they voted scorecard, which they hadn't done for the first vote. Uh, and, uh, and they were going to say, you know, that if, if you vote for cloture, right, like you are anti-American business, you are pro-regulation. And if you go back to 2013 and remember just how intense uh, it's, it's it's still here today, but how intense the pressure was on conserv Republicans uh, getting primaried from the right. Right. Uh, we lost we lost twenty votes as a result of that wow. that letter, and I will never forget sitting in a meeting with Tom Donahue, then the head of of, of the, the the chamber, with um, you know with with Lieberman, with Dan Coats, uh, who, who was in the Senate at the time. John Kyle had organized it. Senator Rockefeller, Senator Feinstein, and Senator Coates, like literally begging Tom Donahue to yeah. uh, not score the, the, the vote. And I mean, it was just, it, it was yeah. an incredibly frustrating experience and we've had to live with that ever since. Right, and, I'll, and, and the legacy of that uh, US Chamber of Commerce led effort really hangs over our yes. cyber predicament right now. You know, you can see it in the Colonial Pipeline episode the last week, but you know, just on the frustration note, let me tell you how frustrating it was for me in being a journalist covering this, because at the very moment, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was leading this effort to kill any kind of cybersecurity legislation. Guess what? They were owned by China. They had discovered Irony, right? they were hacked <laughs> by China. They thought they'd cleaned house. They called in the FBI. They'd done the sweep. They thought they'd kicked them out. And then one of their printers, three months later, while they're doing this whole effort to kill the cybersecurity legislation, starts printing out reams of characters in Mandarin. And the best part was, their corporate DC apartment the thermometer was acting up and someone went in and looked at it and it was communicating with an IP address in China. That is how thoroughly taken over <laughs> the US Chamber of Commerce was when it was leading the effort to kill that bill. And I just had to sit back and bang my head on a table quietly um, while this was all happening. So yes, we could talk about that forever. Um well, I, I would like to, to switch gears a little bit. Um, and, um, you know, this is a, a, not a direct a topic directly on cyber, but it's one that uh, I think is really important. And, um, and that is uh, what, 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 what's happened um, to Emily Wilder, who is a recent um, graduate of Stanford. Uh, she graduated last year, um, who uh, was fired uh, from uh, the AP last week for unspecified violations of the AP, uh, the AP social media guidelines, uh, just two weeks into an apprenticeship um, at the esteemed uh, news organization. Her firing 
uh, came after a right-wing uh, smear campaign against her initiated by uh, the Stanford College Republicans uh, for her advocacy during her time uh, at Stanford as an undergraduate um, for Palestinian human rights. Uh, the smear campaign got picked up uh, by conservative media outlets uh, seeking to paint the AP as biased um, in its uh, coverage of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and then the smear campaign came in the aftermath of Israeli forces uh, destroying the AP's building in Gaza, which um, allegedly also housed uh, Hamas uh, offices, according to um, uh, the Israeli military. I, like, as, as a journalist yourself watching this, I'd, I'd love for you to, to, to reflect on this episode. I, I personally am outraged by it, um, but I'd love to hear your, your thoughts. Yeah, um, I am also, I feel very strongly about this case. Yeah, I do have to be a little bit careful with what I say because we have our own social media policies uh, at the New York Times, but I'll be candid with you. Um, I think it's a, it's a generational issue and it's a leadership issue. And I think that, you know, I was very fortunate to get through college and through, uh, without ever having Facebook, without ever having Twitter, without even having a cell phone. Thank God I had one of these old flip phones. It didn't get service at Princeton. I never used it. Thank God. Pre-cell phone life was like glorious. And had there been social media, I'm sure I would have said some very passionate things online because when I was at Princeton, 9-11 happened. The war in Iraq happened. I actually wrote my college thesis on uh, the hypocrisy of U.S. foreign policy to the Kurds in Turkey and in uh, Iran and Iraq. So I had passionate feelings at the time about this issue. And had there been a Facebook, there probably would have been some comment out there that the Princeton College Republicans could have used against me and I would have maybe never been able to work. Um, fortunately, we didn't have Facebook then. I actually, my nephew, he goes to Pali just next to Stanford. I love him to death. He was born the day I graduated from Princeton and he's this living, breathing reminder of how old I'm getting. And the thing I think about every time I am with him and I just adore him uh, is, is, is he ever, is anyone in their generation ever going to be able to run for president? Um, you know, someone who is not a total political animal from birth um, mining, you know, thinking about their presidential career from day one, you know, with the exception of that person, is anyone else going to be able to hold political office or work for uh, the AP, I guess now, or the New York Times? Because there are going to be artifacts everywhere that could be used against his generation. And it is so terrifying to me that um, you know, newsrooms in particular haven't adjusted their policies and their leadership with that re without that reality in mind. And in Emily's case, you know, if I could say anything to her right now, I would say, take this episode, put it in your back pocket. You will thank them later. You know, this is not the end of your career. This is a black mark for the AP. You know, this is really a leadership issue at the AP. Now, you know, they, the biggest mistake here, and this is one we've, we've faced recently at the New York Times with Don McNeil, our, our pandemic reporter, is they've been very close-lipped about what she actually did that violated their social media policy. You know, clearly she had some posts out there um, about Israel and Palestine from when she was in college, um, and I guess more recently, she had made some comment on Twitter about how the, the wording we use uh, in cases like Israel and Palestine make a big difference, like the use of the word siege versus the use of the word war. And maybe that's what got her in trouble. But that's, that's a little, you know, they need to be very clear uh, about why that violated their social policy, social media policy. Because, you know, who is going to be able to get hired at the AP? You know, I am someone who really stumbled into journalism. I stumbled, stumbled into cybersecurity. But before this, I worked for Ted Kennedy. That was one of my first jobs. I worked on Capitol Hill. I worked for Ted Kennedy. I was in his foreign policy office. I covered the 9-11 commission hearings for him and briefed him on, on them every day. And it was an amazing opportunity. 
But when I got to the New York Times, I was scared to tell anyone that, oh. you know, and um, that that's a problem because I think actually some of the best journalists I know didn't come from a school paper. They came from having these other real world experiences and these other disparate pr professions before coming to the Times. And, you know, I don't want to work for a news organization that's just filled with people that have never made a passionate comment on social media or knew they were going to be journalists their whole life. So they calibrated and filtered everything they said until they got to the hallowed halls of the New York Times. I just don't want to work with those people. And I don't want to work for an organization that wants that. Um, and so these are some really hard decisions. And I think these are decisions that uh, leadership at the New York Times and the AP and the Washington Post and others really have had a hard time figuring out. Um, you know, there's even this case right now in the, su the Supreme Court, uh, which I think they regret even taking about, you know, if someone posts a middle finger emoji because they weren't allowed on the varsity cheerleading uh, squad on Snapchat, um, you know, is that considered a violation of school policy when they're when they're posting that off campus, you know, and what does that mean for free speech? And are we tethered by corporate and university policies in our personal lives? Where does it end? Is it in our house? Are we allowed to talk about these things? You know, is it just social media? So these are really hard issues. And even the Supreme Court <laughs> in hearing those arguments it was very clear. They regretted taking these case, this case <laughs> because they don't want to, they don't want to be, you know, the final word on every sort of Snapchat post um, that comes about. So I don't know how we're going to solve this. I just know that leaders uh, I think, you know, history will look back kindly on those that uh, stood up and, and led through this political climate we are in right now. And I just haven't quite seen that happening yet. Uh, that's, that's very well said. Uh, my, my Stanford colleague, Janine Zakari, and I uh, did a report, a uh, study, um, came the, released it about, it about a year ago now um, on this question of how newsrooms um, manage uh, their role in, in in disinformation campaigns, propaganda campaigns, and you know one of our conclusions is that this is this is a this is a management issue, um, you know mm -hmm. as much as it is an individual reporter issue, and um, you know things like social media guidelines, you know have to be communicated, uh, you know at, at a senior level and baked into the organization so that there is a um, you know more of a zeitgeist around what is or isn't appropriate in the same way that. You know that that other other norms in journalism you know began um, you know uh, and and become sort of just just part of the way that reporters think about their jobs uh, you know there's you know for, so for example right like you know there are all sorts of norms around um, you know not not reporting the name of accident victims until the families have been notified not you know detailing um, methods of suicide you know there's a lot of but these norms exist and they they, they ultimately get codified into guidance but um, you know, but th that that to me seems to be a big a big part of what's 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 problematic now, and that, that has to be driven by leadership. Yeah, um, and it has to be applied uniformly. You know, I know someone I won't name them who worked at the AP, who covered some of the same issues I cover. He's a man. Um, there are some social media posts that he has made that I think are fine, but definitely seem a little bit more borderline than someone saying, you know, pointing out that the word siege and war have different mm -hmm. connotations in covering Israeli Palestine, you know? And so yeah. he wasn't, th th those weren't weaponized against him by a co the college Republicans, um, but that's a problem for the AP, you know, they're gonna have to look back and track, you know, where else, how else they have applied these policies and make sure that it's not just coming down on female journalists who are targeted by a certain group and their words yeah. weaponized against them. That is really, really hard and, and yeah. critical piece of it. Well, you know, and I think the other, the other important point I think about this, this Emily Wilder AP issue is that, I mean, yes, the, 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 the lack of clarity around social media guidelines is a clear problem, um, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that, that this whole episode was perpetrated to try to discredit the AP. Right. Um, right and undermine it as a undermine its reputation for for unbiased mm -hmm. journalism and, and that you know i mean in fact you know it was it was a propaganda campaign against the right. ap and they and they they took the bait 
Um, right. Um, well, we, we have about a minute left. Um, I want to offer okay. you uh, a moment to, um, if there's anything you'd like to say in, in closing um, before I, I bring us home. Okay. The only thing I'll say is I can't see the Q&A right now, but if you want to just skim and if there's one question that jumps out at you, I'm happy to answer it. Sure. Yeah. You know, I, I've been, I've been skimming it and I've been, okay. uh, we, we've actually covered oh, a lot of the questions. Okay. That, great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah. So ra rather than just ask them straight up. Um, well, so, so I'll just say this, um, because you're Stanford, uh, thank you for investing so much in thinking about cyber policy, you know, Stanford, it, it wasn't when I was there, um, you know, more than a decade ago, thought of as a leadership in this space, but now you are. And I'm so glad that you were thinking about issues like uh, the Emily Wilder situation and what newsrooms should do with hack and hack and leak situations and helping guide and inform cyber policy. You know, it's very clear to me, at least, that the wording around coming up with a national transportation safety board for cyber came out of some of the discussions at Stanford, um, and they really deserve credit for that. And so thank you, you know, for, for, for thinking through these issues and really um, pouring resources into coming up with solutions because we're, we're dying for them. You know, unfortunately, we are due for a lot more pain in this space before things get better. The ransomware attacks are not going away. Uh, they will just get more expensive. They will just get more visceral. We will only see more nation states um, start investing in cyber offensive capabilities. And so the time is now to come up with clever, creative solutions around cyber defense. And you guys are doing that. So thank you. Well, we, we appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that, as well as uh, for joining us uh, this morning. Um, it's wonderful as always to, to, to uh, chat and, 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 and uh, hear what's on your mind. Um, I am going to uh, share my screen and just uh, let folks know that we have, uh, everyone can see this okay? Uh, so next uh, Wednesday, 12 p.m., um, uh, we have a, a Future of Tech Commission Town Hall uh, with Jim Steyer, uh, Nate Persley, Renee DiResta, and Daphne Keller. Uh, be there or be square. Uh, and with that, uh, I want to wish uh, everyone uh, a word of thanks for joining us and uh, a fine rest of your day. Thank you.